Good afternoon. I'm so glad you could join us for this special edition of Theoretical Tea and Company, where I am spotlighting and highlighting individuals uh, who have been affected um, by crimes of other people and trauma, and really talking about how they endured, how they endured and how they continue to endure to make it through. This is a special edition of Theoretical Tea and Company. I'm your host, Dr. Janice Murray Collins. Welcome, let's get started. And on on tube and online, we have uh, the wonderful uh, Sarah Collins Rudolph. Uh, many times in this wonderful book that I'm going to introduce to you all, uh, she has been referred to as the fifth little girl. That's one way, and um, I refer to her as the fifth little girl to the only girl uh, that was blessed and and to survive such an atrocity. Um, and I truly believe that is a blessing for her to be here today, to talk in all the other years since 1963, uh, to talk about and uh, what we need to know uh, from her perspective. Only she can tell us who was there, the sole survivor. Only she can tell us um, where she is today, what's going on today, um, how is life today, anything along those lines. We're gonna talk a little bit about that. And I'm also pleased to have with us is the author of this fabulous book. I'm gonna show you this book that I ordered in one day last week. It is nothing written like it that I could find that has the references and the historical aspects. It is a great research uh, resource for your papers, for your programs, your television programs. It has everything from historical applications and implications. Um, back from 1963 all the way up until now. And so there are a lot of things going on with the George Floyd case and how um, the legal system works or doesn't work for people of color. It really kind of depends. But anyways, I'm gonna let them do the talking, but I'm so happy and, and, and so um, blessed um, to have with us also uh, Dr. Tracy Snipe, who is actually the author of this book um, that I have read in about two and a half days, and it's thick. You can see how thick it is. So that's how good of a read it is. You will hear Sarah's voice in it. You will hear the historical voices in it from past people who have passed that were part of the bombing. Um, actually, you can read their words and hear their voices. And it's really, really amazing. I think it's gonna make a great movie. And I think people should pick up on it. So it's called The Fifth Little Girl, Sole Survivor of the 16th Street Baptist Church Bombing, the Sarah Collins Rudolph story. Uh, so welcome to my guest, 
Sarah and Dr. Snipe. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for joining me this morning. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs> praise God. Praise God. It is all good. It is all good. It is all. So, um, so first, Sarah, I want to ask, how are you doing? How are you? I'm doing uh, good. Very good. You know, uh, since the book came out, people has been ordering it from us and uh, they have been enjoying the story and I'm with my husband, sweet husband, and my life has been good for really for 20 some years now since, since we've been together. You know, we, we met in the year 2000 and he's just been a wonderful husband. You know. Yeah, praise God. I can't wait to have him on the show. He's going to come on. Uh, and uh, Mr. Uh, George, <laughs> I call him Mr. George, but Mr. George Rudolph, who is a great, great American citizen who served his time in the war. And uh, he's, he's just a pleasure to talk to. And I do want to talk about that love affair. I do want to talk about that beautiful marriage that you all are having right now. And what's going on has been going on for 20 years, but you knew him before. You were married, you've been married to him, but you knew him before. So we're going to uh, have to uh, talk about it. As a matter of fact, if you want to bring George in just a little bit, since we're talking about him, we can introduce If he wants to come, we can introduce him to the audience. Does he want to say hi or no? Come in, George. He don't like too much to talk on, on it, but I think he will come to talk okay, about just our to say hello. Well. <laughs> Mr. George. Yes, man. Hello. 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 <laughs> hey, George. Good morning. Good morning, Ms. Janice. Good morning, Dr. Snipe. So um, let's start off. Yeah, this is a great time to start because I know you have things to do. So let's just start off, you know, before we get into uh, the atrocities that still continue, let's talk about the great news of how important it is to have a supportive partner. Um, such as um, Mr. Rudolph, um, and he just left, so he doesn't like the cameras at all. <laughs> it is very important to have a, a, a good partner because, you know, some of the things that I can't do, he do it. He sets up the uh, computer for me and each and every time I'm on Zoom. Mm -hmm. And he uh, he just really, you can depend on him. Well, that's my job is to help Sarah in any way I can. That's wonderful. And I'm willing, I, I am willing to do that. That's great. Now, how long have y'all known each other? When did you all meet? High school. Well, we knew and, each other in, in a, a. H. Parker High School because mm -hmm. we was in the same class. Yeah. We took some classes together, but we wasn't, you know, we, we weren't attracted to each other then, but we ran into each other a couple of times downtown. And uh, we just, you know, got together. Because he, I knew him well because he was one of the guys that would always uh, talk to me. You know, during that time in school, not so many guys would talk to you because of the, you know, way I look and everything and what I've been through. But Joy was never afraid to come to me. He would come. He wouldn't say too much. He would just come and say, Sarah Collins, Sarah Collins, Sarah Collins, oh, and I then do. leave. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, that's 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 so precious, and I think that what I've learned from talking with you all over the past week or so is um, the moral, emotional, and spiritual support that you go out give each other. You know, it's not just doing the things that maybe you need help with physically. Because if, for the audience who don't know, when you read the book, um, Sarah was um, nearly blind when it happened, when the bomb happened. And then she and consequently ended up losing um, her right eye. And so there are things, but there's, um, Sarah, you know, there's post-traumatic stress disorder. Bit. Is that right that you have some of that? I'm sorry. I would Yes, I have post-traumatic stress disorder because every time I hear a loud sound, uh, I just still jump because it just put me so much in the mind of that bomb. Because when that bomb went off, it was such a loud sound. You, uh, you can hear that sound all across the Birmingham area because my husband was going uh, to this church, uh, what, what name of your Sixth church? Avenue Sixth Baptist Avenue Church. Baptist church, and it was on the south side. And our church was on the north side. And he, he told me that he could hear that bomb blast from there. And a lot of people around Birmingham, Alabama have told me the same thing, that, that it was a really loud sound. 
Mm-hmm. So uh, that's just something that's in my uh, body, you know, that I look like I just can't get over that sound. Yeah. yeah. Well, we pray, you know, it, it is, and we pray and we thank God for, for the support that you've had. But I think what's important, what the audience um, is hearing and what I've heard, and even when you mention it in the book, um, that we're going to bring in Dr. Snipe as well to, to talk about this. What's really interesting is that a lot of people, when, when we talk about the atrocities that happen to, let's say, young children, when they're just developing, and not just in 1963, but in 1863, and not just in 1963, but in 2003, in 2021, you know, we'll never forget, none of us will ever forget hearing and seeing uh, a grown man become a, the inner child by the name of George Floyd, call for his mama, um, who had already had passed all- over to heaven. Now, and what you're talking about, what I hear and what I see is not just the atrocities of with the loud blast and the things that you have to go through and and growing up without your sister. What I also hear is the spirit and the fortitude of endurance. You have endured. You have endured atrocities, just like I said, you know, I was saying the devil may, may um, trip you, may, may give you a bruise, um, but that bruise will heal. It may give you something else. You stitch it up and move on. But people have to understand that the things that you're going through that happened in 1963 still resonate with you every day. You have to endure every day. You have to get up and be reminded every day of what occurred. And it's amazing. I want you to speak on. It's amazing how kind your spirit still is when there was hate and evil. How you were pos- how could you possibly forgive something that happened to five little children at the 16th Street Baptist? Can you talk to us a little bit about how you've been able to endure? We know that George has been instrumental and integral in your survival and your victory. I'm claiming victory in the fact that you've survived and you are here right now. But how, even before George, even when you were 12, how does a child endure? How do you, Sarah, endure? Even to this day, yeah, she, uh, for one way I do, I keep God in my life, you know, because uh, when I was young, my mother she brought us up in church. We was, we would go to church every Sunday, and uh, but when all that happened, I stopped going to church because I was I was so fearful just to be in the 16th Street Baptist Church. But uh, eventually, I started going because of. Uh, the fact that I was used to it. It was just in my heart to, to go and praise God. And that was, that's the way I was taught to do. But uh, if it had not been for the Lord that took some of the, the, the trauma away from me, I would I would still be the same. Because I went to a church uh, one day, uh, just, just going to visit a church. Mm-hmm. And when I, when I got there, it, the word was spoken looked like it was speaking to me. God, this pastor was talking about repent and, and talking about forgiveness and come to God. So when he began to speak those words, I, I said, I, that's what I need to do. I need to repent because I had a lot of hate on the inside of me. You know, I was, mm-hmm. I was raised to love, but after, the, after that bombing, I started acting really like uh, uh, the white, the, the clans would because I was so angry for what had happened. They killed those girls, and it was a senseless crime that should not have happened. So I began to to start. It would start showing up on my face. You know how mm-hmm. how you look when you get mad, and right, it would just yeah. hit me just to be angry all the time. Now I remember mm-hmm. I used to go into stores, and uh. Ladies would ask me, what's wrong with you? I said, I just look like that. Because it, it, was, it was just showing on my face. But after I went to God, 
And he began to, uh, I began to get in the word. He told, the pastor was saying, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sin. And he was telling about, the, I re re we received the gift of the Holy Ghost. So it was so interesting till I went on. He asked the people to, uh, if they wanted to be baptized that night. And he told us to go to our, our right, the latest. So I went on up the stairs and there was someone up there waiting. It was a lady, one of the saints. She was waiting. And she began to tell me what to do. She said, just tell God you're sorry. And I began to tell God I was sorry, take all that out of me and everything. And uh, I went on down in the water and I got baptized. And when I got up, I was still nervous and I was still fearful. But I didn't have that, you know, hating me like it, like I had before. Mm -hmm. But anyway, when I began to go to this church, I joined that church that night because it was my sister church. Mm -hmm. So when I joined the church, uh, I was just sitting there because I was like a zombie just sitting there. I was still so fearful. So this pastor came up to me and he said, he, he pointed to me. He said, you, he said, come here. So I went on up there and he was telling me what God was showing him about me. He said, God is showing me you have a lot of fear. And he said, you have a nervous condition, but God will heal you tonight. Thank and he you. laid his hand on me and he prayed. And I went out down in the spirit. And when I got back up, I was walking in the newness of life. And I know <laughs> that God, I know that God had touched me. And ever since that day, I've been willing to talk about the story, you know. Praise God. That is wonderful. That is beautiful. What a wonderful testimony. I'm going to bring in, this is a beautiful, beautiful time for me to bring in um, Dr. Snipe, because I am going to, as he unmutes, because um, uh, just for a second, that is a beautiful testimony. Because sometimes God, a lot of times God will do for you what you can't do for yourself. Right. And I want to, um, and, and, and to be so young and to have, you know, you know, when 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 people are killed, people don't understand you. Number one, you're killing a brother and sister because we all come from the same mother and father. That's number one. Number two, they we don't know. You know, we have maybe um, shortened the life of the next person who's going to discover how to cure the coronavirus. Maybe we're dealing with that because we didn't take care of the people we should have taken care of. We are robbing them of not only just growing up with one another, and but we're robbing them of the blessing that they are giving, they're here to give the world. And that's why I said there's something truly special about you and the fact that you were saved. It is truly a miracle that you were saved and you were saved for a reason. So I applaud you and uh, you have my honor and respect that you have been able to talk about it. And then having the angel of George come in and join you in spirit to talk about it. Mm. That is so important. And when you talk about justice and you talk about the legalities in this book that you all have to get and read to really understand, there is no other book out there like this that has the historical. You have Sarah's voice in it. Who talks? She talks about this. But also I want to bring in Dr. Snipe who I'm not really sure how many years it took you, Dr. Snipe, to write this book, but I can tell it was a labor of love. I could tell it was a labor of labor. Um, <laughs> and because when you talk about justice, what you talk about, and you and Sarah can chime in together on this, it took you all decades to get any semblance of just justice from the perpetrator. It took decades for, and because my question is, when the legal system, you have God and the legal system is kind of slow because the system is going through some things. What you can do is there's called a thing of social media. There's called something called writing it and putting it on the record. There's something that is a justice that comes out of an author taking on such a, 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 a huge project um, that has, that echoes and resonates through generations of, of the atrocities that people have to have to go through. So Dr. Snipe, I want to bring you in. Tell me, I'm wondering, why did you write this book? How did you come up with this book? How many, how many years did it take you to write it? Because it is thick, which we know in research is great because it is thick and in quality, which means there's a lot of great information um, and an easy read. But was it, Justice a part of it 
to write this book was justice in your purview of why you took on this labor? Yeah, that was certainly one of the um, uh, one of the factors that I was concerned about at the beginning of the process, and I still am now to this day, because until we tackle and address the issue of restitution with regards to Mrs. Sarah Ruloff, I think that question remains a question mark still in my mind. Granted, the whole idea of forgiveness is it has been fundamentally important in Sarah's journey. Um, first of all, I want to say it's been an honor and a privilege to write her story and to get to have known Sarah and George over the years. And secondly, if you don't mind me um, deferring a little bit, I also want to reference the fact that the publisher for our book, Mr. Kasehun Chikol, I think has joined us. I see his, his email up in the corner. Um, the book is published by Africa World Press, so I wanted to acknowledge that as well to Africa World Press, Red Sea Press. Oh, yes. um, I think he's joined us this morning. Uh, so I want to thank him um, for, um, for joining us. But yeah, it, it's, been a, it's been a, as you would say, a labor of love and at times intense pain too, because in writing the story, we have to relive the story. And it's been so painful. Like if you, I, to me, one of the chapters that, that shows you, in my opinion, the, the impact of post-traumatic stress and the things that we bury in us, right? Uh, the painful parts. It took me some six or seven years to really get to know Sarah, to really penetrate to various aspects of the story. I know I'm jumping a, a little bit ahead of, in terms of the That's plot okay. line, right? But Sarah has a sister by the name of Addie B. Collins. And it took her some six or eight years to even reference that to me of the power and the impact of that story. And I think that that speaks to the level of trauma that even she was experiencing even when I was writing the story. Because I know she knew the story, but the pain of it had forced her to maybe not deal with it in, in, in the way that we would ultimately deal with it in one of the chapters in the book entitled For Her Ladyship. But at either rate, this uh, writing began as a journey. Um, I'm actually a dancer by training, and I initially wanted to choreograph a dance based on The Four Little Girls um, by the music of John Coltrane. So these were some of the the intricacies of the uh, very steps that allowed me to meet Sarah. But in the process of a uh, 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 learning the story, I met some of Sarah's siblings, including her sister, Junie, her older sister, Junie. And it was Junie who introduced me to Sarah. I went to the 40th year anniversary of the bombing because I felt like that was going to be a significant time for me to be at the church. It was ironically the 40th year anniversary of Coltrane's um, com composition of um, Alabama. The 40th year anniversary of the Love Supreme was on the tail end. So I just felt like it was an important time to be in that particular space. And in the process of uh, doing the research for the dance, I got to know Sarah, because just like the book speaks to her life story, even in the dance, I wanted it to be as historically accurate as possible. So in the process of composing and uh, choreographing this dance, Sarah and I built uh, an extraordinary uh, relationship grounded in trust and friendship. And one thing led to another. She was among four different speakers that I invited to Wright State University in the spring of um, 2004 in a, women, in, a, in a program called Four Women from Birmingham. And that's what eventually led into our working relationship. And Sarah asked me to, um, to write her book. Uh, initially, we had talked about uh, perhaps me uh, working um, in various capacities to write the book, but we, I, thought it was all, I thought it was also important to, to write the book in the first person voice to, to bring her, her voice central to the narrative. It's important for women like Sarah to tell their own stories in their words. And that was my goal then and now throughout the process. That to me, that was just very important to not just tell the story, but to tell the story in her voice. So that's these wonderful. Were me. That's wonderful. And it was really interesting, Sarah, that with you being the sole survivor, um, I couldn't really find a comprehensive story until I found this book mm -hmm. on, on you as a survivor. And, 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 and before we get off the subject, how, have you received any restitution um, from what happened? No, I haven't received any restitution yet, but I'm, I'm still trying to get restitution because of the fact that, you know, the city of Birmingham with with uh, involved in all the uh the, the tragic that had happened in the city of Birmingham and also 
Alabama. But uh, yet, I'm still trying to get restitution right. because mm -hmm. Governor Wallace, he made sure that his he was in that he was involved in all the all the uh, tragedy that was going on during that time. Right. So it's a, it's a pop possibility. How I see it is, even though it happened in 1963, you're still dealing with the residual effects of the mm -hmm. trauma. And if it had been differently. And if there had been other people perhaps at the helm, like what's going on now with Breonna Taylor and, and other individuals, that the system is different, the system has advanced, um, that a system that you did not have with such racism within the system, um, that it wasn't, they didn't even bring the individuals into court until decades later. So that put off restitution that people are getting now, it's easier to get restitution, um, but it's, it's harder to, it was harder for you to get it, I think, because of the days and the time, but also because of Wallace and because of Hoover and because of the, um, just the camaraderie um, and the close-knit family unit of people who did not so pleasant things of not speaking, not talking. Um, yeah. But Praise be to God, you know, justice was served. I understand. I remember even on the Oprah Winfrey show, there was a time where one of the grandchildren was able to apologize to your sister, um, which was really interesting. Um, and, you know, because a lot of times what's not talked about is the what the families are left to deal with. And, mm -hmm. you know, the medical bills, the emotional bills, the psychological and spiritual bills. And as you said, you took it to prayer. And I know that God will continue to to guide you. And I think that this this book is, um, I think it should be, it's going to be picked up for a film. I really do. Anybody out there, I think is going to make a great film. And we're in the time for it to happen. Mm -hmm. I believe that what's in the dark shall come to light mm -hmm. for transformation and emancipation. And so God has kept you this far and this long, praise God. And he kept you for a reason um, that I am just so honored just for you to even be here. And with George is, is your fighter, your warrior, knight in shining armor. Because I talk to him just as much, if not more, than I talk to you. Because yeah. he knows the story and he fights for you. Praise God. And that's a wonderful thing. And I know Dr. Snipe writing this book. And uh, I know the um, Africa World Press um, publishing it. It's just amazing. Um, so with that in mind, and we know that that aside, with the restitution, that aside, one of the things that happened in my last interview, I talked to Heather Heyer's mother, um, uh, Miss Bro, Mrs. Bro. It was a ama an amazing interview. One of the things that she said was, she prayed that um, the attention and all that her, her her beloved daughter received, she believes that a lot of it came from the fact that she was a white female. Mm -hmm. She was white, and she she just admitted to that. She said because she sees so many atrocities happening to black people or people of color or to people of LGBT, but let's just keep it with the race because she was talking about that specifically. Um, but she wants to see inclusion that they don't get the attention. They don't get the, just, ju the justice. Have you found that to be the case possibly in your situation? And do you see that still happening today? What is your take on that? Uh, yes, it's, it's still happening today. You know, uh, People uh, around the world, they they look at uh, blacks as not being human the way they treat us, and uh, they they uh, don't want to see us uh, uh, with anything. So I really believe that if they give me restitution, I would you know help people, I, I help my family, you know. But they don't want these things. They want to keep the keep the money out of the black people hanging. Mm -hmm. And for one thing, they they uh still have that prejudice in them. They hadn't changed from from uh being so prejudiced against us. But you know, I, I found out that uh in the in the word of God, they said that that people was gonna hate us like they hated him. So we just he told us that in his word. So that's what we see now. People are just hating us because we are, are black. We haven't done anything to them. For us to hate them, but they just hate us simply because of our color. 
the, what we don't talk about and what we don't hear about, I think you said that for so pronounced. Even with Heather Heyer's mother, um, Susan Bro, to be a white woman and say the same thing that you're saying. Even that, so that, that is, that is the, the semblance of change that you can now divide up people. When, when, when Dr. Martin Luther King said to be judged by the character, not the content of your character, not the color of your skin. That also mm -hmm. means that if people can tr do the right thing, even in the skin, white skin color, there are good, there are people that do good and bad things. Um, in that, in, 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 and, and on top of that, what I think is the healing that's need, not just for you, uh, Sarah, but the healing that you're talking about. In order to have that true healing of restitution, in order to have that true healing of emotional, spiritual healing, people have to at first admit the truth. They have to look at the change that needs to happen in the mirror. They have to admit that the legal systems and the justice systems are slanted based upon race. And until people are willing to admit that, we have to enact laws. And until we're willing to do that, we have Dr. Snipe and other people and publishers who say, you know what, you have a story to tell that needs to be told. Do you, have you thought about why God chose you to survive? Well, I, I really believe he, 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 I would, he've always called me sometime the chosen one. But you know, uh, I went through a lot of things before I got to this point. You know, I had to try a lot of things, you know, before I just really uh, uh, found God. You know, I was drinking, I was smoking, I was partying, I was doing all these things until I got my life right with Jesus, you know. So a lot of people, that's what they need to know. Until they get their life right with Jesus, all these things will continue to happen. It won't be any change. We have took, we have taken him out of all the things that in our life. But we got to, people just have to do just like I did. They got to repent and come to Jesus because all this hate, and they say, and I don't really, I really don't believe it would get any better until they get the, in the, the word of God, because God is about love, but hate is of the devil. So they got to choose who they want to serve. Amen. Do they want to serve the devil or serve God? Amen. So they got to really think about it, because uh, I really believe in heaven, and I want my life to be, I want my life in here on earth to be a loving uh, uh, uh life not hey now I, I would begin to look at how the people went into the capitol building all that was just about hate you know and but people they talk about our race but they they had to look at what happened then we we not we not the enemy we just going through life trying to make it make a, a life by ourselves well, we not going around hating people beating up people and killing people there's some people that do that, but when they after this is done, they got to repent and ask God for forgiveness. Thank you. That's well said. You know, and I uh, we're actually I want to respect everyone's time, so I want I, I want to give everyone an opportunity to have some final thoughts and because that uh, um, when you talk about the love of God or higher spirit and you talk about getting into the Word and repenting and things like that, we have only uh, to look at. Uh, um, everywhere across this world and across this nation, from Charlottesville, Virginia, to Charleston, South Carolina, where people go in and a young man goes in and actually has Bible study with people and then kills these people in a church. And then, and then you go back to 1963, where you, whether you knew someone was going to get hurt or not, that you were actually doing in a church. And so there is a spiritual warfare Praise yeah. God, that's going on. And that sometimes we have to know that justice comes not from mankind who is uh, has fallen short of the Lord. Um, it has to come out with favor. It has to come up with covering because I know that when other people are talking about and they see 
uh, Black people, for instance, are the most violent. I think it's been 400 years and we've never um, attacked the Capitol. It's been, we've never done that. So we have to just look, the truth shall set us free. It's not to make anybody feel bad, good, big, different, anything. It's to set you free, to be the best that you can be, for our nation to be the best that we can be. The truth shall cast to come out. And I believe the truth comes out in your word. I believe that many are called if you are chosen. I believe that you have been chosen to continue the, the story of what happened because you were there. You were you survived and it's the authentic voice in storytelling that cannot be dismissed. I believe that George, your husband was chosen to be with you, to help you get through these past 20 years, to keep you lifted up, to keep you anointed, to keep you favored so you can continue to fight the battle on the war field. And the way that you've overcome and blessed and been forgiving is nothing but the Lord because people have hate built on nothing. People have hate and people have never done anything to you, but you have hate in your heart. But a lot of times see people have hate because they've been hated by their mothers, their fathers, abused, raped, molested. And so what we have to do is we have to go through a healing mm -hmm. on all levels in order to love you, Sarah, to love you, George, is the way you love your enemies, as God says. Uh, but we cannot turn a blind eye. So that's why I think it's important that I think that Dr. S Dr. Snipe was chosen to take on this labor of love, of justice, to write this story. Because now that it has been written, it is now in the records for eternity, forever and ever. Amen. So it will never be forgotten. The four little girls, the five little girls. The one little girl, the fifth little girl that is the only girl that yeah. survived. And praise be to God. And, and Dr. Snipe, I, uh, I, want to, I want you to unmute uh, your, your, your mic to ask and answer the question that I asked. What do you see coming from this? What would you like to see happen next? Because of this type of writing, this research that you've done that can be shared in any classroom in any university, um, what do you want to see next? Yeah, yeah. You, you've put your finger on it precisely. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I want the historical narrative to be co corrected. Until this book came out, you can read accounts about the bombing and not see Sarah's name mentioned or reference. That's a historical oversight. She's an unsung hero. She's a hidden figure who's no longer going to be kept in the dark. So part of my mission in writing this book was to put her narrative in the narrative of Black women, Black children on the front pages, because these tend to be our forgotten, our forgotten heroes and heroines, right? So that was first and foremost in my mind. Um, secondly, I, I think the timing of this book is something that, that I've struggled with. 2013 marked the 50th year anniversary, but somewhere within me, even though I was part of the long, um, obviously Sarah and George, especially Sarah wanted to have the book out then, but in my gut instinct, I just felt like that wasn't the time because I felt like her story, her life was still evolving in major ways as, as we see now. But I think that to have the story come out at a time such as this, um, at the time, during the time of the pandemic, during the killing of various um, um, black men and women, uh, people of color, things that I referenced really in the inter introduction of this book, Body and Soul, it took me a long time to put together that chapter because I felt like her story had to be told within the context of the times that we're living in right now. And that was before, obviously, last year unfolded as it did. Uh, but I just think that it's tantamount for her story to be introduced at all levels, university levels, high school levels, elementary school levels. Um, there are various church communities um, and members of my family who've introduced the book to their congregation. So I see it, I see it having a life well beyond its shelf. Um, I'm delighted that Africa World Press worked so hard in various aspects of the book, including its cover. We went through numerous um, changes to, to come up with what we thought was a fitting front and back cover for a story. Um, the back of the book shows uh, Sarah right after the bombing. That, that's our hard picture to see Sarah laying in the hospital bed with patches over her eyes, 
burn marks all over her skin, but it's important for America to see the ugly truth and reality of hatred. That's how we're gonna overcome it. We've got to face it. And from her story to even the fight, the continuing fight for struggle for victims like Brianna, uh, we, we, the story goes on, unfortunately, right? Um, and when we look at what's going on in our nation now, sometimes I wonder if we're moving forward or uh, moving backwards. It's, it's important in the progress of human life and struggles for us to move forward. And I think her story reminds us of the importance of looking back. We have to look back to gain from the past, like the Sankofa bird analogy that I use um, in this manuscript. In the writing of the book, I find myself using a lot of symbols of flight and imagery of flight. And I think that it, it represents the freeing, the flight of her soul, its journey and its process. And I, I, uh, I commend Sarah, you know, for standing strong then in the past and now and for overcoming, right? Because she is an overcomer despite of all the odds that she's had to face then and now. But until this question of restitution or compensation comes to the forefront, in my mind, I, that's still the, 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 the unfinished chapter. Apologies are important, forgiveness are important, but I know that we say that, well, the case is 15 years long, but look, it took 40 years for you to even bring some of these men to trial, men to trial right? And so until we find a way to better address this question, I, I think this, this work remains unfinished from the standpoint of uh, how, do we, how, do, how, do we, how do we write the concluding paragraph, a chapter to the story, to the saga. Right. Yeah. And from that standpoint, I think the book is important because the story has to be told for, for people to understand the, the importance of that, that yeah. component of the struggle. Yes. Thank you so much. I, I, I agree. I think that um, the story continues. Yeah. And um, in closing, George, did you want to say anything before we close? Well, uh, I thank Dr. Snipe and you well, Dr. Snyder, I thank you for letting this book it come out like it did. I guess it was it was time. But uh it's out and I trust Dr. Jan because she truly said it's a masterpiece. And I thank Dr. Janice for her uh, true word because I trust her on what she say. And uh I really trust you, Dr. Collins, and I thank you for having my wife on your podcast. And we are very grateful to you. And grateful to Dr. Tracy Snipe for publishing a masterpiece. Of, you know, a lot of people really love this book. Yes. And I'm just so grateful that it did come out and the truth is, people will know the truth. Because they read this book, they will see the truth. So it's, if y'all y'all just buy this book, get it, and thank Mr. Chicole for uh, Africa World Press for publishing it. So we thank everyone that had anything to do with this book. We are grateful, me and my wife. We are very grateful. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. I, I thank you so much. I, in closing, I just want to give all the praise and glory to God. It is a God in me that, that directs me. So I appreciate what you said, but it is the God in me and I give him all the credit and all Amen. the praise and glory to God. And let me also say that on this ending note, let me say that I am claiming in Sarah and George and Dr. Snipe, we are claiming the victory because no weapon, person, place, or thing, or bomb formed against you shall prosper. <laughs> and it did not. And the fact that you are here today uh, lets me know and lets the world know that God will cover his children. He will lead them on. And you've been chosen to do this for a reason. And I believe that it is truly a blessing. And I believe that it's a beautiful time, as Dr. Snipe said, it is a beautiful time because people of all race, of all color, of all sexual orientation, of all gender, of all nationalities, the good people are joining together for something just like this to say that we may have the color of brown, black, white, whatever the case may be, but it's the color of love in our hearts that will set us free and get the justice that you deserve and the justice that this story deserves. And most importantly, the justice of every child that perished on that day. 
And there, truth be told, uh, I want to thank you all. God bless all of you. God I want bless to thank you. The workplace. All right. Thank you, everybody. And we'll talk um, again soon. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Dr. Jen. Thank, thank you. you.